and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, What CDOs Need to Know, Foundations of Data Governance, sponsored today by CA Technologies, Makers of Irwin, and Sandhill Consultants. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Hamilton Hay, Senior Consultant at Sand Hill Consultants, and Marcy Barkin Goodwin, President and CEO of Access Software Designs. Over time, HAM has led much, much of the evolution of the CA Irwin product suite and its supporting education courses. He has provided his extensive expertise in information, process, and enterprise modeling to numerous major North American corporations and government agencies. The focus of his consulting and Teach has helped enterprises bridge the space between technical modeling and business success. Marcy founded Access Software Designs in 1989, a model management services and education company specializing in modeling environments, their infrastructures, and the fostering of communication to ensure successful projects, and has provided education and consulting services to Fortune 1000 companies as well as the government for over 20 years. And Access, in conjunction with partner Sand Hill Consultants, offers EMSOS, Enterprise Modeling Set of Standards, an infrastructure product which provides blueprints, model templates, and over 25 critical standards, procedures, forms, and templates for implementing a customizable model management infrastructure. Access is also a trusted CA services partner, offering expertise in model management services to CA customers. We are very lucky to have them both here with us today, and with that, I will give the floor to Ham and Marcy. Hello and welcome. Hi. Hello. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, great introduction. I was going to say, she can introduce us anytime. <laughs> We're really thrilled to be here uh, with you guys today. Um, Marcy and, and I have been uh, colleagues and friends for uh, several decades now, and uh, we share a lot of experiences with regard to uh, the process and enterprise modeling and uh, all various kinds of activities. And of course, I just want to acknowledge uh, Marcy because um, maybe about 15 years ago, Marcy took on the task of really trying to begin to compile, uh, you know, industry-based knowledge around uh, best practices and standards for data. And uh, that work has uh, culminated in what we'll really be talking about today, which is that, uh, that knowledge that we've uh, accumulated, how we put it together, and how we think um, some of these notions and ideas will uh, be of help to, uh, to a number of uh, clients and org organizations, and especially their chief data officers or equivalents. With that, let's, uh, let's plunge ahead. And uh, we'll talk about uh, hello, CEO, and, and friends. So, what a chief data officer? Um, well, I think this is a, a an evolving role, an evolving role in an organization. But the standpoint that, that we look at it, that the, the function of um, managing data, being the design of data, uh, that plays into the success of an organization. A critical function which has existed as long as uh, certainly I've been involved with, uh, you know, enterprise uh, designs and, uh, and, and structures. Uh, so we, we think this functionality is bubbling up to uh, being recognized at, at the, uh, you know, executive level, something that merits um, uh, focus by this, this notion of a chief data officer, someone or some process that is, in fact, uh, responsible for assuring that this corporate asset or corporate asset called data is in fact uh, properly serving the needs of the business. What we're seeing as uh, in our journeys here through the information world is, in fact, there are a lot of organizations um, are still looking for help in terms of uh, topics around uh, data management and, and data concept of data governance. Uh, you know, how do we know where we are, how do we know that we're on the right, the right path to meet our business needs? 
that we pass on some information that will be of uh, a benefit uh, to everybody that serves in that uh, in that role, whether they have the the title or the function. So interestingly enough, uh, when you go around and you ask a bunch of people, you know, questions, well, what is data governance? Um, you find that there is no standard definition, which is ironic given the fact that you know we're really talking about um, you know standards and best practices and how you uh, how you know where you are, uh, you know, how you measure yourself. Um, but there is there are some similarities when you kind of pull together various information from. From, uh, uh, definitions from uh, from experts in the field and uh, and talking to organizations. So there's going to be um, four principles that that come to the fore. Um, the first principle is data is an, an asset. It's not just something that's expendable. Uh, it's not a consumable. Has a lot of persistence. Uh, it has to have some integrity over time, uh, space and location. Uh, and it is probably, in many cases, the most valuable asset of an organization. Uh, it is more persistent than uh, the machines, than the computers. The data is going to be around a lot longer than uh, that, that laptop that you have or that server that, that you have, which will uh, generally evolve. And we know data does evolve, and of course that's principle two, which says fundamentally we have to keep track of you know what is the purpose of the of data. Uh, that is, what is its context? What does it mean to us? Um, the, the information that uh, we glean from these things that we call data um, need to be managed because the environment changes. The business rules change. Uh, regulatory environments change. Uh, the world changes. Uh, if we talk about a concept like customer, uh, we need to understand that uh, we need to manage that concept because it will uh, it will evolve, uh, and sometimes consciously, and sometimes uh, inadvertently or accidentally. Uh, and I want to be actual about managing this this asset. Third principle is that hey, organizations that uh, with that don't really define uh, and implement policies around uh, data and data management, um, they are going to in fact be very vulnerable. Uh, and they may struggle to uh, to succeed. Um, we've seen a number of examples of this. Uh, Marcy got one that the, you were talking about the other day, as a matter of fact. Yeah, actually, um, the idea of um, defining policies to um, have them govern and to be able to prove, um, for instance, an audit trail, um, that situation I ran into. Um, exact problem. I was working with a customer um, on Wall Street and obviously a lot of regulations and so forth, and they were required to go through audits, uh, obviously financial audits and so forth, but as far as what, what we concern ourselves with, the data, um, they were supposed to actually provide um, proof that they had a handle on what their data structures were, how they were being used, when they had been changed, what the impact of that metadata change was across uh, their different businesses and so forth. And they really didn't have a way of doing that. They, they, uh, documentation for standards and procedures is one thing, and we, we clearly start there, um, get fully um, organized, documented, and accessible. Um, but without a way in which you can prove that you have all of that change control and is actually working and so forth, uh, that is not at all going to satisfy an audit. So this company was in a lot of trouble. Um, and um, after we organized it for them, put uh, EMSOS in place and so forth, gave them a structure uh, whereby they could say to the auditors, so here's you know, the day on which we made the change, this is what the impact was and so forth. Um, they passed the audit and in fact, um, I got a lovely email uh, from my um, team there uh, that said that for the first time in years, they not only passed that data management audit, uh, but they did it in half an hour. 
so there there is a way to manage this, and there is a way to to prove the effectiveness of the infrastructure and the standards and the procedures and so forth that you put in place. So that's the good news. That's excellent. That's excellent. That really, you know, and it says also it really illustrates the fourth principle a bit also, which is, um, hey, ignorance is not a bliss. You know, funny as we work with uh, with clients. We find is that uh, there's an awareness, uh, but in many cases that awareness is very limited, uh, and you really need to know what it is that you have in place, your existing or as, as uh, a data management system or governance system. Uh, and in your example here, um, we're getting to an environment which is you know more regulatory. Uh, to me, uh, of those regulators, you need to prove what you have in place, and that in fact that it is uh, it is serving the purposes that are that are needed to uh, manage this critical asset. So, if you look at um, what are the critical factors that are uh, influencing um, you know our data systems, um, and we recognize that you know governance is really a, a very broad uh, broad term in terms of the scope. Uh, is uh, involved in, in governance. Um, it has to operate. Governance it has to operate as a you know a function in this incredibly changeable systems that we're dealing with. Um, you know the exponential increase in, in data, the exponential increase in the, the volatility of, of businesses. Uh, things are bigger and they're faster. And they're growing at uh, incredible speed. So. Um, we able to respond to the various dynamics that are going on. Uh, this reached up in a, n- a number of uh, our experiences, uh, organizations that are uh, adopting agile development technologies uh, to meet the velocity requirements of, um, of their of business changes. And uh, this is now really crashing into uh, some of the more stable um, data Management practices. Uh, you know, the data data stewards have to, and whether they're DBAs or or what roles that they have, where they have to maintain the quality and integrity of the, of their data structures. Um, the velocity is kind of banging up against this uh, the need for integrity and stability. Uh, something that a number of, of our clients are talking about and trying to deal with. Uh, governance has to comprehend all of that uh, complexity. So the, um, some of the aspects of data governance in terms of a framework, we actually want to be looking at data quality, the data management, policy around data, whether they're security policies or information sharing policies or whatever. Um, there's also aspects of you know data and process are interactive. They're mutually interdependent. Um, so you can't look at data in a vacuum, uh, just you cannot look at uh, business processes in a vacuum. And of course, a lot of the, the aspects of governance uh, all boil to, uh, you know, what are the risks of the choices that we make, uh, decisions that we make. So these critical factors are things that the, the folks in governance or and or data governance uh, are have to comprehend. The landscape uh, of governance, if we, we kind of like parse it up into uh, some of the components, uh, this little pyramid or triangular diagram, some of the major elements that we've seen and experienced with our clients. So we uh, recognize that there's things like business requirements and uh, you know the, the measures of business, which tend to be economic measures, uh, not exclusively that. Uh, we also see you know there's the whole issue of these policies what we're talking about in terms of governance and, and stewardship. Uh, but there are also other elements that, that um, like taxonomy, the organization of knowledge. Uh, different organizations organize their knowledge in, in different ways. We think it may all be uniform, but in fact it's quite variable, uh, not only from organization to organization, but in lines of business. Uh, we see uh, significant variations. And some of those were in the past where we had really standalone systems but now being large-scale integration of lines of business, 
uh, in order to meet the uh, economic uh, challenges that uh, come to the Beneath this, of course, is, uh, okay, how do, we, how do we do business? How do we in the data world uh, business? What kind of standards and, uh, and procedures do we, do we need? Um, and most people will say, yeah, we've, we, uh, we need something in this nature. The question is really serving the expanding role of our business. Foundation, the ultimate foundation here is really the consumer the, of, of data information. Uh, we say consumer validator because um, your customers will let you know if the, um, if the information isn't very valid, uh, if you're not doing a, a good job. And you need to be, um, again, tuned into uh, that baseline. Uh, so we each one of these components um, and as individuals, but they're also a collective system. And really, is, from a governance standpoint, need to make sure we pull them all together. Uh, one of them, uh, we've got a fundamental little details here that says some tasks that are associated with each one of these categories uh, involve uh, a variety of uh, specific information that needs to be um, managed and monitored. Uh, think, hey, we need policies. We need to understand count accountability. We understand what our partner roles are. Uh, you know, we need to understand what the communications policy is. Uh, you know, when we're really talking about uh, governance and and, uh, uh, and leadership, There's, they all need to comprehend and have the ability. It's working in terms of data architecture, uh, design for the enterprise, whether they're a business analyst or whether they're an EBA or anything, you know, in between, um, the consumer included, um, need to be able to see the map, the landscape, into of how all these things fit together. They may not be doing that particular role um, in terms of what their their job or role is, but they need to understand, however, how they interact with these other, other roles and other elements of the system. So um, we've, we bring in some experience, Marcy. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is... <laughs> so, so um... In this slide, all of you are looking at my life for the last 20 years, which is why we're, Ham and I are both laughing. Um, so I think I'll take this one, Ham, if that's our idea. Um, we'll go into companies. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time and talk about standards and procedures and best practices and so forth. And it's, uh, it's amazing to me, um, although it shouldn't be at this point, that when I do walk into a company and I say, you know, give me your meek, your humble, your poor, you know, give me all of your documentation about any standards and procedures that you have around data management, data modeling, and so forth, um, I receive a certain amount of documentation, uh, but it's always, um, always, Far, far less than what um, is uh, really critical for what the company needs to be able to be successful. Um, when I successful, I'm saying what is the advantage um, of reuse? Are you getting out of your data structures? Everybody is spending so much time on analysis and so forth. If one team doesn't know what the other team is doing, um, if uh, if that information isn't brought forward, if it's not shared, a tremendous amount of time and money is being lost with each model that's being created to uh, be shared. So, so when I look at standards and procedures, I say, are they getting reuse? You know, are they creating redundant data? A uh, certain amount of redundancy is necessary, of course, but you know, are we constantly reinventing the wheel here when we don't have to? So what I see is that folks think that they have standards, and generally they do have some. Uh, everybody knows what their naming standard is for an entity or a table or whatever, um, but that's only really the tip of the iceberg. Um, and when I start to do a real assessment of the environment, Take a look, speak to people, look at what they've got, and so forth. Inevitably, um, there uh, are many disconnects. There's there's gaps between how they're using the data, what they think is standardized, who's using those standards, and so forth. That gap, I call it the reality gap, um, between where you are and where 
you need to be because um, my attitude is this. A company is an enterprise. I don't care if it's a small company or, or or go up to global companies or government um, uh, agencies and so forth. It doesn't matter. Every company is its own enterprise. And treating data should always be treated from an enterprise point of view, as opposed to the kind of siloed um, departments or, or even the siloed projects uh, that we run into. So that gap of what we have and how are people using it and how are they sharing it and so forth is usually quite large that I've found. So there's only a subset that's being used um, that has a piece to do with uh, the fact that data governance, all we've used this term for many years, um, there's different kinds of governance. And even in a lot of governance programs that I've seen, sometimes the data seems to be the child. Um, and that's a shame because there's a, a huge amount of um, that's taking place in terms of what the company can deliver as a whole if their data is not being taken care of and not governed properly. Um, um, my thought is that truly we have all of these issues. The biggest issue of all for me is that without the kind of data governance that we need to put in place, we can't trust the integrity of data. We see when it's changing, we don't know whether I'm defining customer here and it means the same thing across the board or a different line of business is calling it client. We don't know any of this. And that affects not only, obviously, our source systems, but particularly data warehouses and so forth. So it's a, it's a huge issue uh, for me. And, and that, to me, is, is the biggest problem out of everything that I see in the way of issues in the field. So, um, about, um, <laughs> about clearing that up. <laughs> okay, I'm take it away. Okay, Marcy. Uh, yeah. What? How do we know what we what we don't know? Uh, you say, okay, all these points are, are really great. We really recognize uh, the need for uh, to govern what we do, uh, govern in the sense of manage, uh, in the sense of design. Uh, we need to do need to do all these kinds of things. But how about doing that? How do we know? We are at this point. Well, we use the concept of an assessment in, in terms of how we think through this this kind of problem. Um, by the way, um, you can take a free assessment uh, to see where you are, self-assessment. Um, go to uh, the SandhillConsultants.com website and uh, look under our, our standards uh, section. And uh, there's a little online thing that you can take uh, just for you. Uh, it's basically based upon uh, here's what we have found over the years uh, to be the standards and procedures that uh, seem to keep coming back as the critical uh, core uh, standards and procedures that are that are needed. And you can just go through and do a um, you know a, a check on well what do we have in in place, and that'll give you at, at least the first step in terms of uh, seeing where you'd be uh, in this. Um, second question is how do I determine where I want to go in terms of again, uh, you know, managing data and, and governing what we do? Well, the, the destination is, of course, you know, really depend upon um, your business, your context, uh, but also built upon, um, they're dependent upon what are those industry standards and practices that have been proven to. Um, to help uh, organizations be more successful. A combination of your context, uh, and, and that's a process that, a thought process you need to go through with your organization. That's okay, we know where we are. Now what's to be, where, where is it that we wanna to get to? And, and you should go through um, an assessment and a you know little vision planning kind of thing of where we wanna go, but really commit a large amount of resources to, uh, to implement um, your changes in your system. 
I can certainly, we all tend to, we have an immediate problem. We need to come up with an immediate fix. Uh, we may often find ourselves sub-optimizing, uh, just propagating actually a um, problem in terms of inconsistencies from business to line of business or from IE to business or between our subcontractors and, and our organization. Um, you know, all kinds of things are, are if we continue to do the same uh, small scale, highly localized uh, changes to the system, uh, never attack what Marcy calls, you know, you really got to start thinking like an enterprise here. Some things you need to be able to use across your overall enterprise. So we we call this uh, uh, creating a, a flight plan. Um, you, this is not every flight in the U.S. There are thousands and thousands of routes uh, in the U.S. under the plan. But the G is, uh, is kind of interesting because it means that, that um, if we want to go from uh, a, a destination point, you know, we need to know where we are and where we want to go uh, before we choose that route. But that's uh, the next step. So let's say we want to go from you know, Nirvana in um, Seattle to Nirvana in uh, uh, in South Florida. Uh, we identify those those two points: the as is being our origin and our to being our destination. So we all recognize that there are several possible routes. Uh, some are slower um, than others. Um, and they may have a lot of uh, directional changes. They be, uh, but each one of those represents, um, you know, time that it takes to um, uh, develop and implement what it is that we want. Uh, Maybe misdirecting ourselves because we don't really capture a full, a full picture of our of our choice of route. Um, and uh, and some of the routes might be a lot faster. It all depends upon. How to define and think through the problem. So um, the key thing is to understand really what's important uh, to you to your organization with regard to the data. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, but I already made reference to it in terms of uh, development uh, speed versus um, information stability and integrity. So you all recognize that uh, what is important to you. Uh, economics, uh, the time to market, time to development, time is a is a big factor in uh, in everything that we do. Um, you know, competitiveness. Are we uh, ahead of the curve, uh, behind the curve, uh, trying to catch up? Where in, in that particular area, the other factors um, include not only those external factors but also our internal factors. What level of skills and knowledge do we have? about uh, developing systems, our enterprise, and our enterprise data, uh, what are our capabilities? And uh, we'll find some cases, cases where uh, maybe I'll be short of those knowledgeable resources, both at the implementation level, at the technical level, and at the managerial level. So um, there's possible routes. And what we share with you is, um, you know, the of all of the possible routes, we've, we're finding some very specific uh, research choices that, in fact, um, tend to be most expedient for uh, for many of our, our customers. So, some of the, let me make sure that I didn't advance one too many. Yep, sorry about that. Okay. If I had slide number, I'd see where I am, right? I am, right, Marcy? <laughs> okay. That's why I always say put numbers on them. <laughs> True. So, uh, let's, the notions that that we will uh, emphasize here: tracking your progress, um, identify what's important to you. But you also need to do the same thing. The corollary of which is you need to track what's important to you. You need to pay attention to your measures or metrics. Um, so you want to find those up front. If you know what's important to you, is it, you know, what are your objectives? <clears throat> Everything from schedule to cost, uh, your budget. Uh, you serve, you're serving your customers, your consumers' needs. Um, 
Ability track gives you the opportunity to identify before you get too far downstream or along your path uh, whether you've missed something or there's something that uh, you may have had some perceived assumptions or um, missing initial conditions you didn't understand. Um, so the, having the kind of tracking mechanism for these things is a is a crucial thing. And we find uh, we talked with one customer. Said, well, what do you have in the way of, of metrics? I uh, said, with, uh, talking with your people, they said, uh, well, we don't really measure what we do here. And we talked to the senior management and said, of course we have metrics. Said, I'm, I'm looking at my my costs all the time. And the point, of course, the point was, uh, you know, what is it that, that each of your units is producing in terms of data objects? Uh, are they serving the purpose? Do they have to be reworked? Those are important kinds of questions that need to be addressed. Um, we think that there's, there's also you know, some implementation strategies which seem to work well. Um, the first one is designing for interoperability. This is fundamentally boils down to if I find a data object, say it's a it's customer name uh, as an object, you know, as a as a attribute or column. Um, it, in fact, the same usable across my multiple lines of business. That's that's reuse, designing for reuse. Um, and, and reuse, design for reuse, helps us in terms of data and information quality. We want to that information that needs to be shareable and that benefits the business from being shareable across our multiple lines of business is, in fact, designed that, that way. We all, you know, Marcy has found a lot of her travels um, that uh, the, the managing the data life cycle is uh, is a key element. Actually, if you don't mind, let me let me um, adjust this a bit. Um, uh, this is a, um, you know, all of these are key implementation strategies here, but managing that data life cycle is not something um, that is generally uh, done quite honestly. Or really thought about pieces of it here and there, perhaps. Um, but there's an overall plan and overall um, structure for how we do these things. Uh, these things. So, you know, weed things, for instance, like um, approval uh, procedures. You know, perhaps a logical model is going to get approved before it goes physical, and perhaps that physical model um, will get quote approved before. Um, we get the DDL and and go live with it. Um, this inadvertent change that happens to data is something that people have not really um, taken to heart, and it's it's uh, very difficult to manage data when you don't know when it's been changed or why it's been changed. So by putting certain procedures in place, approval procedures at, at critical points or change control procedures, and I'm not just talking about the code. I'm talking about a model-centric environment where we're we're looking at how has the structure in a model changed, and does that structure affect the physical side as well? Does the logical and physical need to be synchronized? Certainly, the database and the physical model need to be that sort of thing. So, a synchronization process for how we know and how we can trust that that physical model, for instance, is really what is in production, and that. Everything hasn't changed beneath us, and we're not aware of that. You know, how do we notify people that a change has been made, and and so forth? Included in those uh, procedures, we always have roles and responsibilities, so that it's easy to know. You know, what am I responsible for? Um, what does this model have to have to be approved? Who's going to do that, and who do I hand it off to? That sort of thing. Um, governance really requires accountability. And so roles and responsibilities are critical to procedures. We don't just say this is what has to be done. We have to say who does it or what group does it and so forth. Um, and the last thing I want to say about this, changing the data life cycle, is if we don't put that in place, it's very difficult to um, manage the data when we have changing resources. Somebody leaves, somebody else joins. and and the organizations that outsource a lot of their modeling um, have a terrible time if they can't say to the folks in India or wherever, look, here is the way we do it. 
here is how we know our data has integrity. We practice governance here. So here, these are standards and procedures. This is our life cycle. And w- this is what we all adhere to, whether we're on site or we're outsourced. So the managing of the data life cycle is, is really, for me, um, the key to be able to get all of the other pieces working. Marcy, and that uh, really re- leads into, again, we need to be aware of, of what's happening, and that is we understand what is important and, and figure out how to measure that. Uh, we need to monitor that is. Uh, it's, it, measuring is one thing, but if we put uh, that, that data in a drawer uh, and, and don't look at it and don't, you know, back into the organization, uh, here's what's happening. Here's what we see in terms of, of our choice. Hey, we have an initiative to speed up our development process. Is it really working? So we need to that. We need to uh, assess the, uh, the changes that we make. Uh, so we know that we're we're on the right path, and we're also maintaining or improving the integrity of our of our system of our data uh, architecture. So with with that principles and, and these notions and concepts, um, what we we'd like to share with you now is um, you know a technology solution uh, to to consider. Um, recognize that there's uh, again many paths in terms of uh, up to uh, implementation of uh, data management, uh, data standards, uh, the governance that that overlooks all of that, um, uh, you know, hierarchical or ar- overarching um, uh, enterprise view of of what we're doing with regard to data. Um, to so look at some of the uh, some of the things that we're finding. Um, work for for a number of our uh, of our clients. So the first thing we want to talk about is this notion of designing for interoperability. Uh, how do we, uh, in, in fact, you know, can we can we approach concept of what we call error free design? Well, we think the fact that that is um, an approachable goal. Uh, what we want to look at, of course, is you know how do we in fact design um, our information structures, our data structures. Uh, so that they are, are predictable, they're reliable, uh, they're repeatable, um, they have an integrity in the sense that they have captured the requirements from the business. Um, and what we find is that you know you need a you need a really um, a good set of technology to be able to do that. And then uh, we're convinced that our data modeler uh, is uh, you know a technology solution that. Uh, definitely ser- serves that purpose. So I'm going to take a peek now at uh, what that, that really means in terms of uh, as a technology supporting the concept of governance. So look at uh, the concept in, in governance of designing, of the design standards that support interoperability of my data structures. Look at Irwin and I say, okay, what are the, the elements within Irwin that uh, are the principal elements that that support that. Uh, well, certainly in Erwin, the concept is, is uh, instantiated of uh, templates for standards so that you can take what you have as a defined naming standard and you can implement it in a template in Erwin that you can use to uh, start new uh, activities, uh, new modeling efforts, uh, to upgrade existing uh, models uh, to a set of standards, or to use as a comparison tool in terms of let me take a look at whether a particular model or design in fact is compliant with uh, with the standards that are that are key we also look at Irwin from the standpoint of has it, does it support this life cycle process we're talking about and Irwin has got a, a model repository architecture uh, in which you can lay out the 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 structure for storing uh, models and data objects that that support the life cycle um, we satisfy things like accountability, yeah, repository, the roles and permissions in a repository. Um, can we support audit trails? Uh, we can use things like user-defined properties to specify uh, particular properties which are used to, to uh, uh, monitor progress, accountability, uh, and, and so forth. And then the category is like, okay, metrics. How, what can we do in terms of 
of metrics. Well, with Erwin, uh, you not only have you know standard report formats, but you can create additional report formats since you have access to the meta model uh, that allow you to do things like quantify uh, uh, some of the imp the important parameters that you want to look at. Uh, so you take a look at um, uh, some of the specific design standards. Um, the main uh, standards that that Erwin instantiates, uh, including writing specialized macros that you uh, complex naming um, options or uh, use of glossaries, equivalent on the data type, um, you know, master data type standards for, for your particular uh, relational data systems. Um, or you know, custom systems that you wish to uh, to develop, um, you know, it's substantial um, technology supporting domains and the use of domains as part of uh, you know your naming standards for uh, data objects, uh, and of course things like um, standardized templates, um, option sets, and things of that nature with regard to the controlling the generation of of DD. So. Just design standard areas, we see Forger and there are other areas within Irwin uh, that support, um, you know, how do you, you how do you prove that operability in terms of your design? If we look at uh, Irwin's support to uh, data design management, uh, look at the lifecycle process. I see, as I mentioned, hey, there's an architecture uh, within the uh, model repository that allows you to do everything from storing uh, templates to um, uh, of, of record or baseline uh, models um, or individual data objects through you know a model architecture um, standardized glossaries all those elements uh, basically you can uh, you can manage and control within the uh, within the repository uh, accessibility again the roles permissions uh, assigning users to these roles and permissions. Controlling what they can and can't do in terms of modification of the uh, of the objects that are in your uh, in your repository. Else, I mentioned user-defined properties, um, everything from you know creation dates to who the information uh, stewards or data stewards uh, was the approval for this particular object or some objects. Uh, all of those elements uh, can be uh, included in things like user-defined properties. Uh, a, um, uh, a typical data warehouse model involving almost a thousand uh, tables and sixteen thousand uh, columns. And you say, well, do I know how good that is. Well, you know, if you use uh, the ability within Irwin to generate uh, reports, uh, you can do things like uh, tenderize reports, modify them, create new reports. We allow you to do things like say, okay, a measure how many duplicates are there. Uh, in this uh, in this particular uh, model, uh, how many of the uh, uh, tables or columns are have definitions? Uh, if they have your standards to have a definition, and we think it should be, uh, then you can see that hey, you've only got like the uh, eight uh, percent compliance on uh, on your total number of attributes in terms of having definitions. Cause some of your your operational systems problems if there isn't a definition. And it certainly causes you problems over time. From the standpoint of uh, um, uh, looking at it now from Sandhills Enterprise Modeling Set of Standards, EMSS, where we compiled this um, this knowledge over over an extensive period of time, um, this is in fact uh, the lead, and it may be the only tool, as you know it might be, a knowledge base that has this kind of collection. Uh, with regard to managing uh, standards and procedures. So we question things like, uh, from the government's perspective, okay, where where am I? That, that's an interesting question. We talked about that at, at the very beginning in terms of creating a flight plan. Um, sort of the same general topics in terms of uh, how does EMSOS address things like design standards for interoperability, the life cycle process. Uh, the accountability and EMSOS addresses each one of the major categories in uh, in, in some uh, some detail. Uh, do you want to you know kind of reflect a little bit more because you you know principal architect for EMSOS? Um, 
sure you I think know. what I'd like to add here is that, um, yes, MSOS is, is it's a really robust, uh, customizable framework, and it's got all of the critical standards and procedures and templates and blueprints and forms and so forth. Um, EMS was designed from a governance point of view um, because that's always our starting point. Uh, without governance, um, I can tell you to do this and that, but um, if there's no um, superstructure, if you will, for how that will be governed, how it will be implemented and so forth, that it really isn't going to help you very well. Uh, what I'd like to point out here is that um, – Again, whether you're a small or a medium or a global company, you really must deal with uh, issues, best practices, and so forth. And that's really um, how EMSOS, you know, came into being. So, um, you know, with companies such as Pfizer and Wells Fargo, uh, Social Security Administration, Cummins down in Tennessee, all of these companies. These are the rather huge. SSA, obviously, Social Security Administration is a, g a very large government agency. Each one of the customers that we work with has a, has a different scenario in terms of uh, their organizational structure, um, who's going to be in charge of this stuff, who's going to do it, what their roles and responsibilities are called, and so forth. Um, but the common thread that goes through all of this um, is that they all basically need the same types of standards, procedures, best practices, and so forth. It's a question of how they do it that that varies, and that's why um, EMSOS is customizable. Um, but we've identified all of the critical aspects of um, managing the data life cycle and so forth, and that's what's included. Uh, the only other thing is too, that it doesn't really matter what type of industry you are. I mean, healthcare or insurance, retail, manufacturing, um, all of these different uh, businesses, either um, public or private, um, need to have um, a, a way in which they can get a handle on all of this and to make their modeling environment um, work for them as opposed to being something what is a collection of you know, different odd kinds of models here and there. We don't know whether it represents an enhancement that's just for an application or whether it's something that could be used later because of a larger system requirement and so forth. So, um, and the size or the type of the company doesn't matter. This internal infrastructure of governance and for modeling is something that we're, we're seeing just a, a tremendous need for. And, and out of all of that, um, this product uh, was built. So I, I just wanted to get in that. Thank you very much, Marcy. So let's take a peek. Let's uh, open the covers a little bit, uh, just see what um, what it looks like. Um, they Basically, a browser, it is a browser-based uh, uh, technology uh, so that you know, everybody can, needs to, can have access uh, to uh, to the standards, and it's it's a, a set of not only the standards and procedures and forms, the basic core uh, content, uh, but also is included um, you know definitions uh, and uh, examples of things like uh, report formats and uh, uh, documents, uh, templates for the models and, and things of that nature. So let's take uh, take a quick quick peek. Um, Talk about blueprints on the data model lifecycle. Um, as a as a repository of knowledge, uh, it's it's good for people to understand uh, what their uh, what their life cycle looks like uh, and various elements of it. Uh, this is just an example of a, um, a shared object uh, enterprise level um, life cycle that involves application development, data de development. Uh, and also the qualification of objects to be shareable across an enterprise. Uh, if we look at uh, some of the standards, uh, this is just a little snippet that shows you uh, the detailed definition of what an attribute uh, is like. Uh, if we look at uh, the lifecycle management, um, 
it's a uh, an overlay of that data model life cycle that shows um, that where data governance uh, are played, information asset owners, information stewards. Uh, and again, as Marcy said, each organization is going to have a different flavor, but what we have is a core set here that can be tailored for uh, for the particular uh, organizational requirements. Accountability. Um, the particular roles are defined within the standards, and those roles are also defined in terms of where they play a role uh, with regard to the procedures. And all is defined, and of course, all of that winds up being instantiated in Irwin in terms of things like the roles and permissions within the repository, as well as with uh, in user-defined properties. Um, uh, in Irwin instantiates uh, things like accountability. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Audit trails. Um, you know, you, you want to manage your audits. Uh, EMSOS has got uh, things like change control forms uh, that specify the information or checklists for submissions uh, of objects uh, for approval or consideration for things being a globally shared object. Uh, look at the metrics. Our Irwin has a set of uh, standardized model validation forms. Um, what, what we do in the standard side is to say which ones are in fact needed for particular uh, uh, needs in terms of the measures that you're collecting. Um, and I've showed you a, an earlier version of a metrics report that just counted the number of objects with definitions of the number of duplicate objects uh, in the system. Just the, the quick snapshot of, you know, there's the elements that are in both of these technologies that support uh, the concept of governance. We certainly uh, see that, in, in, you know, adopting an approach to governance, adopting, you know, a methodology, the technologies, um, you know, an approach like that we would recommend or some other approach, you will looking for expected, some expected benefits. Um, we certainly look for things like uh, reduced investment in terms of uh, being, uh, the total life cycle cost uh, uh, of ownership. We want to reduce cost as much as we can and improve productivity. So to do that, we don't want to reinvent the same object multiple times within a system, and we see that time and time again with our customers in terms of what the past is. Well, the future has to be different or we're not going to be able to reduce cost and, and, and improve productivity. We need to reduce scrap and rework. Um, people who are constantly repairing uh, designs, um, you know, after they've been in the field, uh, that's just throwing money through the sieve down the drain. Uh, we want to be able to improve our resource utilization um, and our productivity. All things also focus on getting us to time to market or time to solution, uh, to development uh, a lot faster with higher level uh, of, uh, of quality and integrity. Um, the consistency and, and mutual understanding of being of data uh, usage across the enterprise, we find is core to to have lines of business share uh, information and knowledge uh, across uh, their lines of business and the enterprise. And uh, this is becoming uh, more and more critical as our systems become more complex and uh, and more extended uh, globally. And more uh, mergers. Absolutely. Uh, mergers all the time in terms of a very, very complex task to uh, to bring this kind of uh, harmonization and alignment. You had mentioned earlier the regulatory audit. Um, uh, regulate, regulatory environments are getting more critical, more complex, whether it's the financial, pipeline safety, Pharmaceuticals. What's the one we ran the other day? Vehicle identification number. Uh, you know, tracking, be able, able to track. Um, you know, particular items that show up in the marketplace. Food safety is uh, coming into the foreplay. Um, and of course, things like increased, increased uh, complex. Yeah, can't even talk anymore here. Increased competitiveness. You know, need flexibility in our systems. We need to be able to. Turn, um, the data architecture and the application architecture to be able to enhance those or modify those to meet the changing uh, marketplace requirements. And always, always at the end of the day, if if our data integrity 
and lose our ability to share information, it's going to have a tremendously deleterious effect on on the success of our business. We have to design and distribute our data, um, hopefully in a shared environment. Now, how we do that is really critical to the success of not only the modern environment, but the larger overall governance objective. So it, it really starts it starts at home. It starts in, in the specific way in which we tackle um, uh, looking at our data, using the data, and distributing it. All about. I want to leave a couple minutes, uh, you know, a few minutes for questions, uh, and, and just a note that if you say questions to that don't get answered in real time, uh, we will respond uh, through email and so forth. So how it started? Well, we talked about that. Uh, take a little self-assessment. Uh, it's available in SandhillConsultants.com. Uh, to, to drill in a little further, uh, we'll be more than happy to talk with you about the approach to data governance uh, might be right for you. Um, and we're sure that you, we're really confident that you can benefit uh, from, uh, from these kinds of discussions. Um, and uh, we also offer in-depth uh, uh, prize modeling assessments as well that we can talk to you about. Uh, so, you know, in conclusion, we got where you want to go, um, and you got to know where you are. Uh, but if you don't understand your business context, you stop right now and go back and find out what your business context is, because that ultimately is the driver. You know, those of us that are in IT or in government functions and things like that, you know, ultimately it's still a business generating the revenue and the dynamics that are, are important. Uh, so know where you are, know where you want to go, create that flight plan to get your destination, begin self-assessment. If you if you really think that there's things that you need to do and, and want some help on, on today, that's really the, the, the important aspect. I'll turn it back to you. Uh, we really appreciate being able to talk to you folks. Questions, we have a few minutes. Uh, we'll try to uh, respond. We have several questions that have come in, and of course, the most common question is, uh, are people going to get copies of lives? And yes, we'll be sending out a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Thursday, with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, and anything else requested throughout, um, including, if, so if you keep, I just have a couple minutes left here, so if you keep submitting your questions, um, Ham and Marcy have graciously offered to write up answers, and I'll get those out to you in the follow-up email as well. So keep the questions coming. The first question uh, is, how do you deal with uh, senior A, senior management buy-in, and B, data quality issues, and other common issues in the field to get data governance in place? That's an that's an excellent question because it it's really an educational question. Uh, you know, senior management, <clears throat> uh, you, if you're serving in this role, you'll be able to speak the language of business. Uh, you may not have those that skills and knowledge fully, um, so you need to you know get some com com colleagues or patriots that can help you express the best value of, of governance because fundamentally. They're going to say, hey, you know, we're going to have to fund this, and you got to show me it's going to pay off. And so there's the, the 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 conversation you need to have with business, and it may take you a little while to develop that, but it's doable. We we uh, help our customers understand how to express the importance of doing this. I think intuitively we all know it's valuable. The question is, is it how much of a priority is it? You want to add to that? Um, you deal with CIOs all the time uh, to kind of explain this. And um, if, if this may sound conceptual, but it, it really is to the heart of it, which is that it, if I explain to a CIO, look, you've got all of these people spending all of this time, uh, which is money, to do all of this analysis and so forth. Um, and if you are not getting reuse out of that, you are spending additional time and money that is completely unnecessary. Um, it's more expensive.
expensive to fix something than it is to do it right from the beginning. Now, I'm not, I've been in the business long enough to, to have a certain amount of reality. Uh, I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna here, certainly not. Um, I've, uh, I've been uh, on the battlefield for a long time. Um, however, um, if I have a project and it requires a data model, at the end, and I have procedures in place to say, hey, these things now are considered shareable. Why? Because they have integrity. They have definitions. They've gone through approvals and so forth. At the point, if I make everyone aware of the fact that, hey, guys, we have these data structures. We can reuse these. I don't care if you're using different databases or whatever. I can start with these on the logical side, make sure that I'm satisfying the business requirements, and then do what I have to do to implement that in different physical ways. That's fine. But if we all go back and work with a structure that already exists, rather than spending a month or whatever it takes to recreating that as if it didn't exist, you cannot tell me that that does not give you time and money, that it's just the way it is. And I, we can do much more detail than that, but if we start with just that premise, with a CIO, they get it. So you have to address the bottom line. You do have to address and we metrics and so forth and so on. But conceptually, everyone in upper level management, for the most part, will get it. And that's where the discussion starts. And, and I'm afraid we're just past the top of the hour here. Thank you, Emma and Marcy, for this great presentation and Q&A. Again, I'll get to all the questions that we didn't have a chance to get to to you guys so we can get that out in the follow-up email. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. I just love always, of course. When, when you guys are so active and and uh, and and participate in the webinars, um, and of course another big thank you for today's sponsor CA Technologies in Sand Hill, who of course enabled us to provide these great webinars to everybody for free. Um, and just to remind everyone again, we will be posting the recording and the slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and I'll get that follow up email out to you as soon as those, those things are up. And a quick, a quick thank you, Ham and I, for everybody who. Attended. Thank you, everybody. Definitely. Absolutely. And, and thank you guys for this great presentation. It was very engaging, and, and uh, I think we, we everybody really enjoyed it. So I will give you guys that information, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.